Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, a, uh, a production of Gigabit Libraries Network and the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, our series right now, is, having started nearly three years ago, uh, focusing on the pandemic as libraries in response has evolved into libraries in response to a whole range of, of crises. Of course, the health crisis, which many would say, me included, continues, uh, and the various other things that have come up, social, political, economic, and of course, the big kahuna, which of course is the uh, climate uh, crisis. Uh, that's a uh, rising challenge, and we we spent some time on that last week. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the application of LEO technologies to space and uh, to uh, health and education. Um, our sponsor is the Internet Society. Uh, this is the group that provides the .org domain and uh, it's been very helpful to us as a special interest in this technology and has released a recent study on it, which is difficult because this is a, a kind of moving target. There's so many developments that happen, uh, seems each week, it's hard to summarize what it's all about and what its implications are, but they've done a good job of it and we appreciate their, their support here. Our media sponsor is uh, Broadband Breakfast. This is a ongoing broadband focus group that uh, has weekly gatherings of a wider range than we're talking about here. Uh, this series is exploring the potential for low earth orbit satellites. We've talked about that, not gonna go into a lot of detail on it, uh, presuming that most of you have some uh, familiarity with low earth orbit satellites. Uh, this is the the kind of the range of topics that we're exploring in the series. And uh, particularly right now, today, uh, education and health. We last week, we focused on uh, the use of these devices in disaster response. Any kind of large scale or extended outage, you know, communications is really uh, essential. We have a few of these we've been able to deploy in the US. Uh, one in, uh, this is an example of the resilience factor, uh, not, a, not a major disaster, but an outage. It was a line cut, a fiber line cut to little Anaconda, Montana, small town in Western Montana. And this one fiber fed everybody in, in, the, in the area there, including the cell providers, AT&T and Verizon. So everybody was knocked out. Everybody was offline. Uh, they had electricity, but no connectivity. Well, the one place it did have connectivity was the little library, which had its dish pointed up at the constellation overhead and didn't miss a beat. So the whole town basically had to go to the library to, to communicate. So that could have been a, a major disaster. It could have been you know, hurricanes, floods, the whole, the whole shebang, but it just was an example of an outage and how that resilience is a key factor. Maybe not the only reason to invest or explore this technology, but in addition to expanding and enhancing uh, access, it's a uh, it's a secondary and and potentially fantastically valuable use case. So our speakers today, uh, we're lucky to have uh, people with hands-on experience with this technology. Scott and Jack and Colby are going to tell different stories uh, that, of their use, their experience with this technology. We we'll get to them. So we've identified three principal barriers to adoption, which gets us kind of excited about the notion of, of these institutions uh, and this technology, which is new and unique. Uh, you know, this is not terrestrial infrastructure. This is space-based. It's, it's basically a global last mile solution. That is to say, it connects to your location, uh, a, a router, a bundled router with your dish and you're you're connected. So there are still some 3 billion people in the world that are not connected after all this time and all these billions, hundreds of billions of dollars by now in infrastructure, they're just not extending it to people 
uh, that are farther out in less developed locations and people with less money. So this is one of the great things about libraries, public libraries in particular, is that they offer access to anyone, public access, which we think is a really big deal. But it's also um, a question of affordability and usability. And this is where libraries come into play. Uh, traditionally, they make things available for free or no fee uh, or low fee, perhaps in some cases. And that may not be a total solution because you have to go to the library or be near the library or some kind of a library outlet, but it is something. And then the usability part is helping people use these. Now, the libraries are not the only ones that are doing that, but that's really their their one of their main services to help people access information, information technologies, books, internet, you name it. So that's that closes the loop on on uh, some extent on helping everyone. If they're close to a library, they should be able to participate. So libraries are responder. This is I'm not going to get into this because we spent a lot of time on it last week, but this is this is getting really really serious, and so. We have um, uh, we have identified the uh, the the use case for this as as resilience factor, uh, and this is not so much for mitigating the circumstance which is already happening and serious, but for dealing with it, for coping with these kinds of circumstances, extreme weather events. It's adaptation. And while mitigation has to happen at the global scale and big actors have to make this thing happen, I mean, we can all do our part, but very large uh, entities uh, uh, have to come into play to change, turn this ship. But in terms of adapting to it, we can all deal with that at the local, at a home level, at the community level. And this is where this uh, technology fits in. So this is our, our series of presentations. This is today. We're looking at education health, uh, particularly. And then uh, we're skipping next Friday, but then the following week, we'll have Bill McKibben, who is a noted uh, 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 environmental uh, climate activist. And he's gonna talk to us about how he sees the value of connecting these unconnected communities, uh, since they are the most vulnerable to these events, they would benefit in theory uh, most uh, most greatly if they had a connectivity, uh, connection access. And this is something that actually you can deliver connectivity anywhere, like just pop it up. And that's what we're going to hear about today. So the potential for that in places that are way out beyond the, the terrestrial infrastructure is large because you just mail it out and plug it in, you're in business. So let's get to our uh, panel today. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have these stories. And so we're gonna go first with uh, Scott. So Scott, thank you and uh, welcome. Let me just get out of here. And uh, take it away, Scott. All right, thank you very much, Don. It's a pleasure to be with you folks today to tell the story of uh, Wise County and how we came to start um, utilizing uh, Starlink by SpaceX uh, to serve our students during the pandemic. But I always like to start pre-pandemic and you know point out that long before the pandemic struck, we knew we had a connectivity problem uh, with our students um, and their homes. And that you know you've touched on some of those reasons, whether it be availability or affordability, you know whatever the case may be. It was always referred to as the digital divide or the homework gap and those types of things. But, um, you know, so then along comes the pandemic and, you know, it thrusts us into virtual learning. And, you know, this was something as a public school division that, you know, uh, we had tried to bring awareness to that digital divide and the homework gap. But unfortunately, now we were going to be living right in the middle of the circumstances of things not happening because as technology directors in the state of Virginia, we kept trying to bring awareness, but we were hoping that, you know, folks realize this is not a school problem, a public education problem. You know, this is this is someone else's problem to fix, and we hope you get it fixed you know, for us. But uh, unfortunately, you know, as the pandemic struck, we transitioned to become Internet service providers in some form or fashion. And at first, 
you know, obviously we didn't think that that was going to be a solution such as uh, Starlink, but we did know that, you know, we needed to start looking at ways to get these students connected. So, you know, like most people, we first started extending the Wi-Fi to our parking lots. We started making sure everyone knew where public, you know, uh, connectivity was available with our libraries and our different restaurants and by means which they could connect. But what we found very quickly was unless this connectivity was in their home, they weren't really interested in it. Um, you know, no one was going to come to a school parking lot, even though it's well lit. We have security cameras. You know, that's where we kind of wanted our folks to come. But, um, you know, who was going to come and sit in a car for an extended period of time, you know, while their child did, uh, you know, remote learning with it 30 degrees outside, um, you know, so there was a realization that we needed to get to the homes and we looked at every opportunity possible from could we subsidize, you know, uh, programs by, you know, our local providers of Xfinity, um, you know, because they offer uh, internet essentials, you know, could we help folks get that to their homes, what obstacles were there in place, um, you know, afford, you know, with the affordability, you know, are there folks there that could serve them and maybe we could give a little assistance to get those homes, you know, up and running, but, um, there were just areas where, you know, cell phone service wasn't even available in Wise County. Uh, you know, we think we have a very beautiful area, but there's a lot of mountainous terrain here that makes it very difficult for service providers and, and folks to even get cell phone service to folks in some places. So, um, we had a lot of data, um, in front of us. And unfortunately, what we found was 30% of our homes reported not having uh, internet service at their home, you know, prior to the pandemic. Unfortunately, as you all are probably well aware, data is only as good as the folks who are providing that data to you. So those folks who were saying that they had internet service at home, uh, we found that a lot of them were relying on mobile hotspots in areas where, you know, their service wasn't great to begin with. So the uh, percentage of our students who really didn't have adequate internet for remote learning ended up being at around 50%. And, wow. you know, that, yeah, exactly, Don. Wow, that's exactly what came. And so it was kind of overwhelming as a technology director to think here we are in virtual learning, you know, and our, we're trying our best to reach these students, but 50% of them are probably not going to have a very good experience in virtual learning. So, um, again, we were Scott, looking at let me, mobile let me jump in. Scott, yes, excuse me. Let me just jump in because I, I, I think you're making a really important point about kind of availability here. Uh, people have been handing out these hotspots like crazy uh, for the last, well, several years. And it's great if you've got a cell network that can support them. <laughs> but there are a lot of places you point out, you know, the cell system doesn't, doesn't work. And so what then you're actually, you know, stuck. Uh, I just wanted to add, I just heard from, from Scott who uh, is in a place he can't get connected. So I'm going to ask you, uh, while I'm interrupted you, to kind of extend a, a little bit and, and say what you might about Scott's project you know, on his behalf, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, I mean, Jack, excuse me, Scott. Uh, it, Jack can't, uh, can't join. He says he can't right. get from where he is. So if you could say a little about his project as, as you can extend it onto your own remarks. But thank right. you about yeah. That's really a exactly. key. There's no other solution when you're just out there and there's no cell service. Thanks. Sorry. Right. Jack is very intertwined into our story. So I'll just, uh, you know, kind of elaborate on more of Jack's side and take up his time that he was allotted here as well. Um, but so, yes. And, and one thing I should say is that that 50 percent now that 50 percent comes into all those categories you mentioned before. Some of that was availability you know, a lot of that was affordability, but, you know, different circumstances led to 50% of our student body needing some help because, um, you know, if a parent went out and had a mo, you know, they had hotspot on their cell phone, you know, off of their cellular plan, but they've got four children at home. Number one, you can imagine how quickly that data allowance or, you know, and then some, uh, some providers then cap your speed after a certain amount, even if you do have unlimited service. So, uh, I very quickly had a lot of parents reaching out to me, even those that had hotspots and different things saying, okay, my, cell, my cellular phone bill last month jumped to $350 because of data overages. What are you all going to do about that? You all are the ones who are saying that we have to learn virtually. Well, you know, I said, unfortunately, it wasn't us who said you had to do that, but we're trying to make the best of these circumstances. So there was just, you know, a lot of things coming to us. So 
we were looking into, you know, mobile hotspots on our own. You know, we threw 250 of those out there. We were trying to help connect folks that could afford to pay for their own to their ISPs that could help them. We were encouraging ISPs to, you know, to help with costs and, you know, in, in the pandemic, get folks connected. You know, our county uh, got involved um, and that's where Jack came in. You know, Jack serves as the clerk of the circuit court here in Wise County, but Jack has always been a space enthusiast. Um, he's brought many programs to Wise County, uh, you know, space related for many, many years. And there's too many to, to even mention those. But Jack approached me and said, you know, hey, Scott, have you ever thought about Starlink? And I said, well, certainly we have, Jack, but there's like a two year waiting list there. So, you know, we don't we don't have two years. You know, we need to be serving folks now. And Jack said, well, you know, um, anyone that's ever met Jack, um, you know, Jack doesn't take no for an answer and Jack doesn't care to ask. And so Jack started making some connections and I was just shocked at how quickly Jack came back within a matter of just a week or so and said, OK, we need to get the county administrator and your superintendent together with you and I for a meeting because we can maybe make this a reality. We just need to see, you know, what can be done. So we all got together and decided this was certainly something that we wanted to pursue. Um, and so even even before I had a chance to start gathering the data on who we might serve, Jack already had a potential contract uh, negotiation, you know, in place. And uh, so Starlink and SpaceX ultimately offered to serve 45 homes uh, in a 10 mile radius of Wise County uh, with this service, um, you know, and we were able to connect each home, the equipment package and two years of service for $3,200 per home. And so, you know, for two years of service for places, uh, you know, uh, we started immediately looking on who was the best 45 in that area to serve, uh, as we knew there were going to be many more. So we quickly, you know, put a little matrix in place to say, okay, if they have no cellular service and no other option, then they're number one. If they have, you know, traditional satellite internet, then they're number two, you know, and, and started putting some things in place so that we could serve them. But, you know, um, I jokingly say, you know, Jack kind of takes care of the contractual and political realm of the project. And I do the, uh, you know, the school division side and the dirty work, so to speak, of, uh, you know, reaching out, making sure that folks uh, are interested in the service, that they give us permission as a school division to provide their information to Starlink to get their um, accounts set up and those types of things. And with the first 45, I'll even admit that my technology department, um, went out and actually did the installs because we were unsure what to expect in this installation service. And as folks are probably well aware, we have grandparents who are raising their, you know, their grandchildren. And, you know, were we going to really expect them to be able to install that themselves? And we didn't want to put an additional burden on them. So we agreed as a group and with the blessing of our school division to go out and install this for these folks. And, um, you know, it was, it's pretty incredible. And, and I wish that the parents of some of these folks could be on here to talk about the difference that it made, but it was really, I mean, honestly, heartwarming for me and my team to go around. And I will tell one quick story of a, of a young man who was waiting on us and he was a high school student. He was a junior firefighter and for connectivity, they did have a um, traditional satellite internet service, but to download a PDF document, he reported it would take up to 12 hours for him to be able to even download a document. And so what he was doing was picking which day or two of the week that he was going to the firehouse so that he could, you know, utilize their Wi-Fi to connect for school. Um, you know, as you can imagine, he wasn't, you know, there during times when the instruction was live or anything. So he was watching recordings. And so his experience still wasn't the best, even though he was making it happen, but he was having to drive 12 miles to town and then 12 miles back. So he um, he was waiting on us that day that we arrived to install his equipment. And he was so excited. He already had the Starlink app downloaded, um, you know, and, and actually rather than us setting up his service, you know, we installed the satellite, but I walked him through setting up his own service. And then once he had it set up, I said, well, now it's time to test. And this young man, when we arrived, was showing us the cars that he enjoys working on. He had some old Mustangs and Corvettes, you know, sitting there and, uh, you know, talk to us about those. Well, I said, well, it's time to test. Immediately, he goes to YouTube and pulls up a video about one of those uh, Mustangs that he had sitting out in the driveway that he was wanting to work on. And uh, that YouTube video loaded up and was streamed immediately. And I mean, the joy in his eyes and him hollering at his dad to say, hey, dad, look, look, I'm already watching YouTube. Um, you know, I said, 
the value in that is probably great. I can't wait to one day pass him and him riding up and down the road in one of those Mustangs I saw in the driveway. He may not have attended math or English class any more than he previously did. I can't say if he did or not, but, uh, you know, but I guarantee you he's, you know, doing some research and getting those cars up and running. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits to that connectivity, but that was just one of those stories. And, you know, people here, you know, they've tried for a long time to get the connectivity and, you know, we're not pushing against broadband initiatives or, or projects, but, you know, we had a need that needed to be met and it needed to be met immediately. And we didn't have time to wait on the terrestrial fiber to be run or any of those uh, things because, um, you know, we did have some pushback as a school division on, you know, utilizing this type of service. Um, but I'm just a technology director in far Southwest Virginia who needed to have children connected to the internet. So it didn't bother me who was upset, you know, it was getting those students connected that was priority number one for us. And so um, what that led to for us is I can sit before you now and say, you know, we started in, well, February 1st, 2021 was the official contractual start date of that service. Now, Starlink spun it up a little early for us because we were doing those installations prior to February the 1st. But, uh, you know, I can say it on February 1st, 2021, 45 homes in Wise County began utilizing this service. The feedback and the experience was so wonderful that we partnered with our county and Jack continued to uh, work to make things happen, not only for Wise County, but for the school, uh, well, for the surrounding counties, but we were all focused on serving our school children, uh, you know, with this project. And serving school children means we're getting some of the homes in those areas, but there are many more that could be connected, you know, utilizing this service in those areas. But a lot of our neighboring school divisions. Wise County alone are, is now serving almost 300 homes with the with this service, and our users see um, download speeds of around 145 to 200 megabits per second download speed. Upload, I've not seen an upload speed less than 40 megabits per second. And anybody that knows that's pretty good. And we've watched the latency drop tremendously. Um, you know, I did have some slides, but I've talked myself right through most of those uh, to pull it up. But I do want to point out, you know, uh, Starlink said this beta project that we joined was called the Better Than Nothing Beta. Um, boy, we discounted that very quickly. Um, you know, it was better than a lot of things. Uh, so the Better Than Nothing, uh, you know, we went forward. We even told folks that we were going to connect. Hey, be prepared because this is called the Better Than Nothing Beta. But the reality is, is that um, it's better than than a lot of the services that we have that are, that leverage that terrestrial fiber. Just to be really honest with you, um, now it wasn't for everyone, even those folks that needed it. Um, one of the pictures I had in in my slideshow showed one of my uh, techs, you know, using the app to look to the sky to see what kind of uh, signal. Because one of the things with Starlink, you know, their app allows you to check for obstructions ahead of time that may limit or hinder your connectivity. And we used that and, you know, the tree coverage was just too much for the service to be beneficial for that home. So unfortunately, we had to look for another option for that home and move, uh, you know, move that account to someone who could really utilize that type of service. But again, it was part of our process of evaluating what is the best solution in these areas. And again, we're now serving almost 300 homes in Wise County and uh, many of our surrounding school divisions. Uh, Jack could have given us probably the total of all the school divisions and things, but uh, I stay focused, you know, pretty much on Wise County, even though we've tried to help guide folks in, in their um, data that they gather, you know, as a school division to be prepared to, to serve these folks here. So, um, you know, it's been a very good service for us. Um, again, I think the power in it doesn't come from Scott Kaiser. You know, we've had... Um, news articles out there that you can read and go back and see where parents of these students have spoke about the difference that it made in their students' experience, but also the their lives in their home because, you know, they, they've now not only got adequate internet for that child to attend uh, remote learning sessions, but they as a family now have the world opened up to them, uh, you know, in their homes. And I will say that even now that we're on the backside of the pandemic, um, you know, we're going to have virtual learning days when uh, when snow hits the ground here in Wise County. You know, we typically during a school year can miss uh, 20, 25 days because of just the terrain. And when the snow hits, it takes a little while to melt and get our buses back on those routes. So we have 10 virtual learning days that the state has said we can use throughout this year. So, you know, there's going to be 10 virtual learning days and, 
Um, you know, one of the biggest things for us is now education doesn't have to stop at 330, um, you know, when students go home, because before we knew that, you know, it was a waste of our time for teachers to try to extend the learning beyond the school day because these folks couldn't get connected. So I'm uh, I'm going to stop there, uh, you know, and turn it over. I think I've taken mine and Jack's uh, a lot of times here, but uh, I do want to point out, Don, that I do see Jack has joined us. So huh. um, okay. and it's connecting to the audio now. So before we uh, before we turn it over, I thought you might want to reach out and if you had any questions for Jack that maybe I didn't answer. And like I said, he might can tell you the total number of homes being served in um, in Southwest Virginia in Southwest Virginia now. But I do know that number, you know, is three three hundred in Wise County. OK, well, we'll go to Jack uh, in a second here and see if we can we can hear from him. But uh 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 great story uh scott and you know just suddenly solving uh, an impossible problem that's there's no feeling quite like that and uh so but you mentioned that there was initial pushback from the school district what form of pushback was that well now i i didn't mention the school district because the pushback oh, was I'm not sorry. from the school district um uh you know broadband you know Internet infrastructure, it's a very hot topic in the political realm. Um, yep. So the pushback didn't necessarily come from the school division. You know, we're happy to serve. I found myself, and, you know, we'll just be transparent on some calls with the chief broadband advisor for, that was in place then for the state of Virginia, you know, from the governor's office, as well as the Virginia Department of Education. And, you know, just bluntly, um, you know, Jack told me before we ever got into this, you know, to expect pushback, um, you know, but like I mentioned before, I'm just a technology director here in Southwest Virginia who's looking to serve students. And so that was my message to them. We're not stopping any broadband projects that are out there. You know, as a matter of fact, we wouldn't be having these conversations if maybe those projects had been completed, you know, previously as we would have all loved to have seen. We wanted to see that work continue. However, I told them to show me a better solution for these families now because now. they actually needed the service six months prior to when we were able to provide it. So, uh, you know, the pushback certainly, uh, as far as locally, you know, our local county government, you know, opened up their pocketbooks and, and helped us to push this out, you know, further than what it was. So the pushback was really not from anyone that was directly affected, you know, by this program. It was those of concern. And I'll just tell anyone who is considering this, you know, we entered this contract and just like I told those folks, we have a contract that binds up, you know, gets the equipment package and two years of service. At the end of that two years of service, just like any other service that you contract, whether it be from, you know, SpaceX and Starlink, or if it's Xfinity or, you know, one of our other local internet service providers, at, at the end of that contract, if they raise the rates to a point you can't afford, you walk away. Uh, you know, so it's no different than any other service, you know, that anyone would contract. And we had a very affordable service, especially for folks who couldn't get it otherwise. And, uh, you know, we were we were thankful to have that opportunity. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I mean, this is a common kind of circumstance, and I appreciate the, the nature of the kind of the political context for it. And, you know, all the states right now are being challenged to come up with a plan. I mean, there are tens of billions of dollars that have been appropriated for broadband infrastructure, and most of that money is going through the states. Well, the states do have to have a coherent plan on how they're going to spend it. That's all great. And so it's it's one of these justifications uh, for doing investment or exploring this technology is, well, we would, but, you know, we've been notified we're slated to get fiber. So, okay, well, when? Uh, I don't know. Well, what it takes, what that means is, you know, like three years at top speed because there is just a, a crush on demand and it's, it doesn't, you just don't do fiber overnight. And so for, as an interim solution, what could be better than mailing out a box with a dish and you're up. And then if you get, after you get fiber, which we all want, of course, now you have a dish that you can use as a reserve, as a backup. Like I gave the example of a line cut when that happens or any kind of outage happens, you can go live with your dish because I, I had this experience personally. Uh, I had a, a, a rural location where I was using the dish, but it was just a summer place. And so we turned it off 
after we left. And then when we went back next year, so can, can we restart? And they said, sure. And nine minutes later, we were live. Nine minutes. I mean, I can't get anybody on the telephone in nine minutes. So it's it's a really a, a great uh, backup resource to have, uh, even if you've got it. You mentioned uh, upload of 40 megabits. You didn't get below 40 megabits. Did I hear that right? No, sir. I, I have yet because I still occasionally go out and, uh, you know, I know where the dishes are installed. So um, I go out and check speeds. Um, you know, I have I have a couple of friends who have them. And, um, you know, so I, I still check the speeds. And like I said, even when we were installing them and just testing them to make sure they were up and running, I have I have yet to see uh, upload speed less than 40 megabits per second, which is just incredible. Um, it really, is. you know, I hadn't heard that. It's, right. I've been one quick, and you know, I, I alluded to the fact that we had folks in our area who had tried multiple ways to get connectivity prior to us bringing Starlink. One of those installs that we did had actually tried to leverage their LTE service with a Parsec antenna uh, and a Cradle Point router. I mean, just trying everything to bring it in for their children. And I asked them if I could do speed tests, you know, prior to hooking up the Starlink there for them. They were one of the first installs we did. So I did a speed test on their current solution and their um, download speeds were eight megabits per second on that LTE service, um, you know, and with two children and two healthcare professionals working out of that home, you know, it was uh, it was a strain to say the least. The The moment that we hooked the Starlink up, they, they had the 40 um, plus uplink, but their download speed at that time was 120 megabits per second. So they went from eight megabits per second 120 megabits per second, as you mentioned, with a three-step process of setting setting that system up. So just another example. Okay. Well, I'm going to come back and ask everybody at the end, you know, the downside. We haven't, we've heard all the beautiful stuff so far, but keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, but you did say that, uh, well, it sounded like you're arriving at your 24 month uh, contract right about now, right? So yes, sir. For the next? first for the first 45, um, their contracts will expire. And they have they, a solution or work. You know, we when we no, when we put the service in, they they understood that um, you know, the first two years of service and the equipment was paid for. And at the end of that time, they would either um turn in their equipment or they would pick up the monthly service costs and continue the service. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Um, well, well, good. Uh, uh, Jack, are you are you live there, Jack? Have you got? Not, I'm here. Okay. Good. Well, um, uh, Scott gave a good overview of uh, of the technology and the story and and your role in pulling it together on the uh, on the SpaceX side. Um, yeah. He took up some of your some of your presentation time, but you want to add anything about you know kind of how it's going and and what the outlook is. I think this is what a lot of people get interested in. We're, we're getting a lot of positive reports on the performance of the technology, but then as far as the outlook for the for ongoing and how you see the project success or or interim. Well, I heard the uh, question. First, let me apologize for being tardy. I'm down at Cape Canaveral. I uh, tried to use my iPad and I'm ready to throw it out on the, into the Atlantic right now. But nonetheless, uh, that aside, uh, the project has a total of about 600 right now uh, involved, which probably touches well over a thousand students throughout the region. Uh, there are multiple counties involved uh, in far Southwestern Virginia. Uh, and I'm sure Scott, which I knew you would be in very capable hands with him, I cannot stress enough how important Scott Kaiser was to this particular startup of this project. I'm a former legislator and know the politicians for better or worse in Virginia and also the pluralistic pressures that uh, AT&T, Verizon, fiber companies uh, can uh, employ in the state. Uh, there were 700 million, ultimately over a billion dollars invested in fiber companies throughout the Commonwealth and is still being invested, none for Starlink. And knowing that uh, in the many hills and hollers of uh, far Southwestern Virginia, that it was gonna cost 
thousands upon thousands of dollars to run the fiber whenever they could get to it. It was um, intolerable to see school children go without knowing that they were going to be years into the future before they could be reached. So in working with uh, members of the General Assembly, we got uh, a $500,000 budget amendment uh, to launch the project. Governor Northam on the way out put an additional million dollars into it. We're about halfway through those funds now, and hopefully we'll continue to find students uh, to uh, offer broadband. We had mapped out originally with uh, Scott's help in all of these counties through the technology directors uh, where the uh, broadband was needed for students. So uh, the uh, General Assembly last year passed and, in, and the governor signed a bill requiring school districts to provide the data of every student who lacked uh, access. Now that's not necessarily because of a lack of broadband, it could be affordability as well. And in our region where poverty is running 22 to 25%, that is a major issue as well as access is affordability. So that's where this program has been an extreme benefit. And Scott and I've been discussing ways and means of trying to address that as well. And that's still up in the way, uh, up in the air with local policymakers. Certainly, there's been a lot of pushback, and I know it's been said uh, from the uh, telcos and fiber companies. They they want to be able to convince local governing officials that they're there to save the day, and uh, that uh, uh, SpaceX uh, Starlink is similar to other antiquated satellite providers, and that's just. You know, it uh, frustrates me to confront that. It frustrated me to confront it on the state level. Uh, nonetheless, we adapt, improvised, and overcame to this extent, and we intend to go forward and continue to prove the worth. In the future, with the balance of the funds, if it does not go into school districts, we are watching what's going on in Eastern Kentucky. We're looking and talking to uh, hospitals and healthcare providers of uh, across uh, a wide metric, whether it's assisted living or um, substance abuse centers and the like, uh, and other telemedicine providers to look at that as a future alternative as well. Great, super, uh, Jack. It's uh, it is a big challenge. And, you know, it sound you, you look at this stuff just for a little while, and you can see that it's really very different from any other technology that we've that has come around. And the geostationary satellites that are that are twenty plus thousand miles out uh, create a, a lag time for the signal, and is, they just don't have a reputation as uh, as as real broadband. But they have fallen into the you know kind of better than nothing, even though <laughs> they're pretty expensive and they don't perform well, has been the general report. And so this is. This is broadband satellites, and so people go, well, it's just another satellite. It's what it like, is it like 3G compared to 4G or something? Like, you know, it's just really, really different. But, but thank you, and uh, uh, that's a great segue to the to the health application. And our uh, final speaker today, Colby Hall, uh, in uh, in Kentucky, and, and you also make both. You've all made the point about uh, the the terrain in Appalachia. I mean, the, the mountain range running, you know, really far north and south through the country is really difficult terrain for uh, for infrastructure, even, you know, whether wireline or towers to reach out into these low places becomes extremely expensive and complex. Part of the reason that there's so little connectivity out there, which the satellites coming more or less straight down seem to be able to handle. So, so Colby, welcome. Tell us uh, uh, a little bit about what you're doing and how it's how you think it's going to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I know we got people joining in from all over the place. Just good day to everyone. Uh, it's uh, always hard, tough act to follow Scott, and uh, it's always uh, awesome to hear his story. And uh, I'll just say this up front: were it not for Scott's uh, honest feedback and positive experience. We never would have been able to get our pilot projects off the ground because you'll come to find out that the state that funded the program for us 
really, really uh, valued Scott's feedback and the success they had in, uh, in Southwest Virginia. So Scott's always good to see you, Jack. Good to see you as well. We spoke briefly on the phone and you connected me to Scott. So we're all kind of uh, connected here, the, the, the three of us. So uh, I'm Colby. I'm the executive director of a, of a nonprofit organization called uh, SOAR, which stands for Shaping Our Appalachian Region. You'll quickly find out, at least in Eastern Kentucky, I won't speak for Southwest Virginia. Uh, folks love a acronyms, so you get the alphabet soup no matter no matter where you go. Um, at a very high level, SOAR is a, um, uh, an economic development organization that was put together um, at the end of 2013 when the coal industry kind of had its final collapse in the realization that it, it, it wasn't coming back. And so our mandate was to think about what the, the answer is how do you fill those those economic gaps that were left behind, you know, as coal has has deteriorated and, and what's the future look like? And so at the top of that list, at the top of our blueprint is connectivity and broadband. And simply put, our our overall goal, right, is to blanket every single one of our counties, which we have 54. There's 54 counties in eastern Kentucky that are considered Appalachia by the Appalachian Regional Commission, um, is to blanket every single one of those counties with functional internet. Right, so, you know, 120, whatever the federal definition of broadband is, our goal is to make sure that no matter if you're born uh, at the outskirts or in a county seat or wherever the case is, that you have access to the same essential infrastructure as, as anybody else. And so uh, that's from day one, and I've been on the job a little over two years, that's been our, our number one priority. And uh, I came in at the golden age of, of, of broadband, Don, as you pointed, with with billions in funding coming, coming down the pipeline. And so, um, Starlink had always been on my radar coming in. Um, uh, the technology, just it, it being an, an emerging technology that seemed like it was going to be good. And then understanding that uh, similar in Southwest Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, we've got some really hard to reach places that um, if you spend any time studying the um, economics of fiber broadband, it not only is expensive, but it's, it's going to be time consuming just on its own, right? And then you layer in some of the political considerations and it's like, well, I don't know if this will this will ever if this will ever you know change, right? And so, um, I, I started researching and understanding how we could do it. Now, I ended up making a connection with a, a friend of mine that I graduated with from the University of Kentucky, who works at SpaceX, who was kind enough to kind of um, put me at the intersection with the people that that run Starlink's pilot projects. Similar, Scott, Jack. I, I'm assuming we we got connected to the same group of people there that 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 ran these pilot projects, these beta projects um, as you listed it. So I found out that, you know, in our in our case, um, we could get uh, 30 to 60 dishes, uh, prepay for the equipment, prepay for a year's service. So it, it, it turned out to be right around $50,000 is what we would need in funding to find to be able to bring one of these off the ground. And so as I was researching that, I was reached out to from the Kentucky Department for Public Health, who had some money, COVID related money, um, that they were looking to deploy. And they were coming to us asking again about hotspots, um, all these kind of existing tech that, that do good work, don't get me wrong. But our biggest issue in Eastern Kentucky, much like Scott said, was it's in the homes where we need coverage, right? It, it's not, there, there's, there's folks are, are showing up that, you know, we got students doing homework in fast food restaurants just to keep hitting that point on. Um, it's, 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 it's in the homes where these folks don't have service and where that's the biggest need. And so as they were asking about this, I floated the idea, well, how about we route some of that funding and let's, let's do a Starlink pilot project. You know, I've got all the numbers here. I've got the relationship. We could move pretty quickly on it. And so uh, after going through um, all of their review process and the contract process, we eventually were able to get the first pilot project off the ground in um, southeastern Kentucky in a county called Bell, which Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, actually backs up to Wise County or is very near Wise County. Well, it's close. It's close. We're, 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 we're in the same area. I'm, I'm thinking about maybe Wise is close to Pike where I am. That's right. So I, I stop at the Kentucky line, right? So I'm, I've, I've got to learn, do a little bit of homework on southwestern Virginia. So we go to Bell County and Bell County was picked strategically for a couple of different reasons. One, we had a county judge there, kind of like our county administrator that was very, had already been talking to me about Starlink and thinking about how we could get some service out there. Two, we were able to go and find some people deep in the county that um, nobody, realistically, no internet service provider really wants to have to deal with because they are so hard to, to, to reach. So our thing was, is we were gonna avoid the politics of the situation a little bit by saying, listen, 
we're picking the toughest people to serve. And this is who we're gonna try this project out on. Now with the Kentucky Department of Public Health being involved, their purvey was instead of students, it was uh, low income senior households. We were trying to identify seniors with Medicaid that didn't have great connectivity, that with enhanced connectivity could facilitate um, a better suite of telehealth services, right? So that's who our target audience was. Um, make a long story short, you know, we found 30 of them in Bell County. I personally was on the ground installing about half the dishes. We had half self installs. Uh, again, just blown away. As, as Don, as you mentioned, um, you, you go to a place in a little community like RJ or Kettle Island in Bell County, which is, I mean, as, as rural as rural gets, well, as rural as rural gets until we go to Martin County, which is the next pilot project I'll talk about. And then, um, go to a house that's struggled with connectivity since the internet began. This dish took 10 days to get there. We plugged the dish in, set it outside, and you know, the speed varies, but 150 down, 50 up. And I did that in 10 minutes, shook their hands, said, we're here if you need us. They're ecstatic, and I go on to the next house. I mean, and, and I did, it took me two days to get them installed, two, three days, and we had some self-installs. And uh, as we've kept in touch with those first group of, of recipients, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. I have no, um, you know, Starlink's not paying me or uh, we're, we're, we have no direct, you know, there's no reason. Very, very good reviews uh, all along as we've touched in, you know, gotten in, into touch with these folks. From time to time, I think we had one dish that had an equipment malfunction. They replaced the dish. But if there's been any troubleshooting and we've handled all those calls, uh, SOAR has, it's been something, something like the dishes unplugged. So we always would start with the very basic stuff like, oh, your dish is not working. Can you make sure it's plugged in? Well, it's not plugged in. Okay, plug it in and let's see if that fixes it. Okay, it's working now. All right, great. You know, it's been really basic stuff like Classic. that. But overall, everybody is super, super pleased with the service. And so the first pilot project was a huge success. The state was pleased. They asked if we'd be interested in doing another one. And so this time, taking what we learned from the first one, we went to a county called Martin County. And both of these counties are, uh, again, very poor. You know, you're looking at, you know, half the national uh, household income median. You're looking at poverty rates around 30%. I mean, it's, it's some of the poorest parts of America. And the part that of, of the county in Martin County that we went to, um, Meat House Creek is the community that was there. I mean, it's, it's as remote as remote can physically get. And so the issues, that the, the problems there were even deeper. Folks don't even have like landline phone service in some of these households. I mean, they're saying we can't, we can't call out to 911. So not only are we looking for Starlink to facilitate telehealth, we're looking to run a phone over this so that we can call an ambulance that's already gonna be over an hour away if we have an emergency, just to make sure that we can get through. Well, like in Bell County and Martin County, when we announced it, I mean, everybody, the, the, I guess what surprised me is it, it's word of mouth. So, you know, we would hook somebody up in Bell County and then we would get a call from their neighbor. I mean, people were coming to us knowing more about the program than we ever would expect it because everybody was just talking. And that's what happened in Martin County. In Martin County, I mean, it just lit up. I mean, we probably signed the 30 people up, 30 real quality candidates based on the program requirements you know, in a week or so. And then, you know, it took us a couple of weeks to get the dishes out there. And again, it was very, very remote. And um, I mean, they, they're blown away. I mean, uh, Don, I don't know if it's you or Scott that mentioned this, but yeah, folks that have been able to take in a part of, of 21st century entertainment, streaming services that we take for granted, they've never come came close to those, but they're able to do Netflix. They're able to, to do all these things. I mean, it was very, um, I guess, rewarding to see. I, I don't know how else to put this. They felt like a, like a real, I don't want to say a real human, but like somebody that's like normal, based on what everybody else around the country gets gets to do. And so, um, that that project has gone really well uh, as as well. And, and we're working on a third. It's not finalized yet, but. Um, Again, we, we survey these people, we check in and ask how it's doing, you know, the speeds vary, but by and large, um, for what these folks, some of these folks were paying, uh, especially in Martin County with maybe some of the traditional geo um, uh, stationary satellite uh, internet access and what they were paying. I mean, it was just, it, it, it's hard, you don't, it light, light and day, night and day, yeah, um, and day. doesn't, doesn't do its service to, to talk about the change. So 
Uh, I'll, well, I'll stop there. I know I've probably talked a lot, but those are. No, no, that's, that's, uh, that's great, Colby. Um, one of the uh, one of the remarks that you've made and, and uh, Scott and Jack echoed is that, you know, people really don't want to sit in McDonald's or the fire station to do work, you know, every day. And, you know, I appreciate that. But if there's nothing else, we've, be, we've been used this term, you know, better than nothing. So from our perspective, uh, this is where the library comes in. It's a backup. It's not ideal, but it is a, it is a partial solution. And in terms of telehealth, until you can get everybody, uh, you know, connected, which is going to be an interesting process, uh, they may need another place to go. And so we've got uh, uh, Diane Connery on with us here. Uh, and Diane is in Pottsboro, Texas. And Diane has been running telehealth. She's also a Starlink user. Uh, but uh, Diane, can you talk a little bit about how you're set up to do and deliver telehealth in the facility? Yes. So I am at home this morning. So I'm using my Starlink connection so you all can be the judge of <laughs> how robust it is. Um, we are in a small small town far north Texas, about 90 miles from Dallas. So when COVID started, we set up telemedicine room in our library, largely because transportation is an issue. Um, it's a long distance to get to quality health care and there's no public transportation or ride sharing in Pottsboro. So yes, ideal is in the homes, but at least we can provide a place closer to the population that they can connect. And I'm talking uh, with USDA right now, they're paying transportation cost for some of our residents to go into Sherman, you know, town about 30 minutes away for behavioral health um, visits. And so they've identified if they could uh, pay transportation just to get to the library, which is about the third of a distance, how much that would save in transportation costs. So people will be able, in that case, to, to come to the library and connect. So we have both physical, medical, um, partners as well as behavioral health. So you have you have equipment set up in the library that is not kind of normal home gear, right? Not just a camera and a computer. Right. It well it it's pretty basic. I mean, we've got a desktop and it's it's hardwired to make sure it's, you know, um robust and then we have a webcam that's a little wider because one of the things the healthcare providers had been talking about is some people were trying to do the telehealth appointments sitting in their car, kind of juggling their phones on their lap. And number one, that wasn't good lighting in all cases, which can be important for these visits. But they also said sometimes people, um, they wanted to observe the person's gait. So in our telehealth room, which is about 10 by 12, the person can get up and walk around and the healthcare provider can see that. And then, you know, library wise, one big piece of it is even for people who have connectivity and have the devices, there can still be that issue with they don't have the skills to use it. So providers, um, talked a lot about they were spending a significant amount of their appointment time, you know, troubleshooting technical issues with people and like, okay, you're on mute. So in a library, um, we assist with, with that part of it. And so to me, the library is just really well positioned, but we have hired a community health worker and so one of our um, goals is to, for that person to go do visits in people's homes and take telehealth to their homes. Right. I mean, this is a story of library kind of blending into all the gaps that happen in any kind of a system, uh, electronic and human. Uh, you also have a kind of a, a secure environment, at least a, a private, a privacy level in this in this space as well, Diane. So thank you for that uh, update. So 
I'm thinking about everything that's just been said over the past hour. And I'm going, well, why doesn't everybody have this? This is so great. I mean, what does anybody have anything down, any downsides to all this, any doubts, uh, you know, any problems, or is it just all honey and roses? Jack, I'm going to ask you first. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, FCC, E-rate, uh, other funding opportunities. I think there is um, maybe at state level, I don't know about, certainly in the, at the Fed too, there's been a bias against uh, SpaceX Startlink that uh, concerns me. And I raise it constantly with our senators from Virginia and our congressional delegation and will continue to do so. It's wrong. And certainly, you know, with the competition between land-based fiber and uh, low earth orbit satellite, the internet of things are gonna change the world. We're gonna use sensors galore and we're gonna have tremendous demand for more and more broadband, not less and less. So, you know, it, it, it is an artificial competition that should aggravate us all as consumers. It's, it's an interesting point and, uh, about this uh, IoT, Internet of Things, which is generally a very, it, it, not broadband per se, but low bit uh, communication between devices. Possibly you have cameras, of course, but uh, that's, a, that's another development that's happened recently is Starlink uh, tying up with uh, uh, T-Mobile to actually deliver services to the phone, you know, right to your phone so that the T-Mobile network itself uses the Starlink system to deliver you know, text and, and email, which is low bit activity, but valuable stuff. Uh, you know, Everybody talks about how fast is it, and we're mostly focused on the need for video, but we also need, absolutely need text and, and mail. I mean, Netflix is great, I love it, but I have to have email, I have to have text service. I mean, it is essential service. And the difference between the, the capacity requirements of those applications is vast. So uh, it shouldn't be discounted. The ubiquity should be uh, given uh, extra uh, credit in this discussion. Uh, Colby, you see what's, you see the downside here or what, what do you, how do you see this unfolding? Yeah, I was just gonna, well, I, I don't see, well, I'm sure there are, there's, a, listen, fiber is still king, Don, right? And the, the, the money that's out there today, if it's used to, to, to build fiber infrastructure, that's great because that fiber is going to be there for a long time and it is still king. But in those areas where that's just not, you know, feasible realistically in the next five to 10 years, Starlink is such a, a, a great option. And Jack, to your point, I know E-rate is a permanent or a more permanent FCC program, I think it's a travesty that Starlink is not eligible for the affordable connectivity program, which gives you that $30 a month subsidy yep. to help bring down some of that cost. So I'll, I just wanted to add the ACP remark as well. And Diane, to your point, we're in the process of uh, getting a couple of community health workers ourselves in the final stages of that uh, uh, grant agreement in our uh, it's going to exactly, as you said, going to go into those homes that have these dishes to make sure that we're fully um, using all the telehealth services that are provided. So I may, Don, you may have to connect me and Diane offline so I can get some feedback and uh, she can give me some pointers on um, how to make sure that we get up on the right foot when we get those community health workers started. And do. And uh, you, you bring up the E-rate point, which is a common one on this. Uh, there are a bunch of, as Jack pointed out, issues related to the FCC and Starlack and their relationship. Uh, but uh, the the issue around E-rate is that to be a, uh, a E-rate eligible provider, you have to apply for that and you know be be approved. Uh, Starlink had been required to do that under the Rural Development Opportunity Pro uh, uh, Fund (RDOF). Uh, which the FCC withdrew. You know, it was like eight hundred million dollars for to connect. I don't know, hundred thousand or multiple hundred thousand people in rural areas, and the FCC just withdrew it because they claimed that Starlink was not adequate to uh, meet the. You know, before they actually had to, but they weren't going to. Well, that under that program, they were required to become an E-rate provider that was removed so they're no longer required to do that and they seem to be taking their time with it because 
Well, just because maybe they don't feel appreciated. I'm not quite sure, but it would make a huge difference. Uh, there, there are programs for subsidizing home connectivity, the emergency connectivity program and so forth. It's, it's just, we've got so many programs under this new broadband fund. Everybody's uh, you know, struggling to kind of get their head around it. Uh, Scott, we're gonna go to you for a kind of a last statement about what you think this is all about and, and how you, well, first, you know, give us something negative to say. We have to say something negative about this stuff uh, just to be a little bit credible and then and then uh, wrap for us. Well, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we would love that Starlink could have served everyone who needed the connectivity. But, you know, unfortunately, we have tree coverage and things that, you know, continues to keep the satellite service from being a feasible option for folks. Um, you know, if it had a way to work its way through the through the trees and through the leaf coverage and things like that. But, uh, you know, so it, it can't serve everybody. So I guess that's the only, you know, downside I could say, you know, we definitely stood in the gap. And I think you all saw just a little bit of Jack's passion there. I've been so fortunate to be partnered with him and that passion. But here's my passion. The amount of money that we've spent in laying middle mile fiber drives me insane. Um, you know, we have homes in, in Wise County that I can take you to right now who have uh, fiber laying at the bottom of their driveway. And homes are being asked, customers are being asked for $26,000. $500 to come a quarter mile up their driveway to charge them for service on the backside. So, you know, I see my frustrations in all these broadband projects that continue to lay middle mile fiber and, you know, do not connect homes. If we're going to continue to pump money into terrestrial fiber, it needs to connect homes. We've got enough middle mile laid that the middle mile needs to be in use before we lay more middle mile, in my personal opinion, especially when we have opportunities like Starlink to connect those. And I've looked people in the eyes and sit across tables from them who have, even, even with the money that's coming out now saying, we can't go up that holler because there's only two houses, three houses there now. And the data shows that in 10 years, two of those homes may be vacated and there may only be one there. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, for me, the burr in my saddle, so to speak, is that, you know, we have so much unutilized middle mile fiber, but we continue to see all these funds put to these internet service providers who are just continuing to not connect homes and connecting homes is, you know, by far uh, the biggest priority in my mind that should happen. Money should not continue to go to people who are not connecting homes. And as we've mentioned here for $3,200, homes in Wise County were connected. $3,200. Homes were connected. So how many, you know, how many homes could you connect with the billions of dollars, you know, that are going out to lay more middle mile fiber that's not utilized? So I'll stop there because I could I could go on and on. <laughs> Let me do my arithmetic on that. But I think the number is quite a few. And uh, Don, I appreciate being part of this conversation today because, you know, just hearing Diane and, and knowing just because we followed the journey that, you know, Starlink is moving mobile and to hear her talk about mobile telehealth providers being able to go to those homes that now they can take their equipment and their connectivity, you know, to that home via a, a solution like this and the partnership with T-Mobile to see these things progressing. And I just wish that sometimes, um, you know, some other entities would get along with the progression and utilize what's available to us to, to help our people now. Well, uh, amen to that. Uh, this is a year though, that I think the possibilities of those kinds of things happening is live because, because of all this money, all these funds, every state is trying to, you know, they're in an intense learning stage because they're pulling the stakeholders together, trying to create a coherent plan to get a hold of this cash to apply it. So hearing things like what you're saying about, you know, surplus of middle mile, unused middle mile, all these things need to be in that conversation at the state level. The states are now really key to this. The Fed can't really deal with it. It's just too much. They don't have the, they don't have the people to actually do all the projects that need to be doing. That's why they've distributed most of the money through the states who themselves actually lack that, but they're, you know, they're stuck with it. And so they're trying to scramble and, and pull things together. So it's an opportunity to engage in these conversations at the state level by everybody, all the interests uh, that, that, are, that are out there. So my only concern, the technology has absolutely proven itself on the front end. What we don't know is how will it hold up over time as more people use these systems 
what's the capacity level? I think this is an outstanding question. I mean, there are a bunch of other kind of issues related to to uh, the the viability over long term of uh, space based uh, communications debris issues. Uh, the astronomers have kind of a bone to pick with the reflections off these satellites and so forth. But it looks pretty pretty promising, I would say, from the early early stage here. And, and this really is an early stage. We're still early with this stuff. But that's a reason to explore it. That's the reason everybody should be doing some kind of a project to see what it's really like, to have a firsthand experience like you all have, and then decide, well, how, okay, with what we think it does, how much are we going to invest in it? How much are we going to give to this? And and what's it, how is it going to fit into our plans? And if you don't have that knowledge, that experience, then you're just, I don't know, waiting for Columbus or something. So we are, we're a little bit over time, but this is not a, a TV program, so we don't have to close immediately. But uh, I, I would like to ask everybody to unmute, if you would, please, everybody. Please unmute because if we were together, you know, in a room together somewhere and there's a, a conference and you 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 people would come in and, and deliver these remarks, you'd be getting a round of applause. And that's what we want to give to you right now, everybody. Please unmute and give our, our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, with that, we're going to close the recording. Uh, thank you very much. Come back on February the 3rd. Bill McKibben is going to be here and talk about some really interesting prospects for using this technology in the way that you've all described today. So where is stop recording?